Hello, this is David Mandel, and I teach your um, CIS 121 class on computer systems. And I'm making this video to make a uh, few comments on um, computer ethics. We studied computer ethics a couple weeks ago, if you're in my spring of 2017 class. On the other hand, I'll probably use this video in future classes, so maybe you've heard some of this, maybe you haven't. Uh, in any case, um, when we read the chapter in the book, and also some of your homework that you turned in to me, um, it's, it's good. And um, the chapter in the book is cool, except I have a little bit different take on it because I come from a different area of computing. Also, it seemed to me like it was too te textbooky. It's ethics by the man, kind of. Uh, it's what big corporations want you to think about ethics and maybe not real ethics. Um, at least there's two sides to many issues or multiple sides and so I want to discuss some of the other sides to uh, uh, ethical thought on uh, in computer affairs. Um, in doing that I'm going to go through the chapter in the text and just grab point pieces here and there or I might grab pieces here and there out of the slides I really am not going to go through the slides or through the text in detail because you've, you know, because it's there. Somebody's already done that. Okay, the uh, first thing I want to talk about is the importance of ethics. I think that's why we were put on this earth in part to be ethical and to treat one another like, like decent human beings and one of the best things we can do with our lives is helping other people and our work, our, our whole being should be about that. So ethics is fundamental. From a more practical point of view, if you want to do business in the business world, you have to have some standards of ethics or a lot of people just don't want to do business with you. I really, really don't want to do business with people I don't trust and I don't consider ethical. So, you know, I pick my lawyers, my accountants, my my colleagues based on some level of ethical behavior. Are they all perfect? Well, no, none of us are perfect by any means, but that is the concept um, and it's very important. Also, it's important for a computer for professional or for certain other professionals, and I'll come back to that term later, but, but it's important because some computer people and like certain other professionals are in a position of confidence. A computer systems in a computer programmer often is just writing software and he's like, a person that digs ditches or builds tunnels or builds um, um, uh, houses. They have lots of ethical obligations, but there's nothing really special in their ethical obligations. I don't mean they can't forget ethics by any means, but they're not privileged to any special information that they really have to guard. Well, maybe a little bit, trade secrets, whatever. But um, but in the case of, say, a, a systems administrator, somebody administrating a company's computers, they can know everything about the company. They can have privy to the, uh, they could read the, the CEO's um, email. They could know about um, Sam's email, who's misusing the system, using it for personal benefits. Um, they have, they know a lot of stuff, both about the corporation and about individuals in the corporation. And they have a special obligation to, of confidence to use that information in an ethical way um, or not use it, depending on 
the ethics of the situation. Um, I, I mean, sometimes the ethics is, I didn't see that. Shut up. And, you know, it never happened. Other times the ethics may be to uh, turn somebody into the law. Um, and it, those are ethical decisions that have to be made. Um, the um, I should say a word about profession. I consider a computer professional to be a professional. The book considers nobody to be a professional unless there is some license or some legal thing that says you're a professional. Actually, here in Oregon, we're just now going through a lawsuit where um, somebody wrote letters saying that he was an engineer and that he thought traffic signals were set at the, um, were too short. Uh, the, the yellow was way, way too short and it allowed law enforcement to give uh, red lights, uh, tickets for running red lights when the person didn't have a chance to stop. stop. And there was insufficient warning. And in his letters, he did claim to be an engineer because he has degrees in engineering from engineering schools at accredited universities within the United States or within Oregon, I believe. So, you know, um, I would call him an engineer and I'd say he was a professional. He is not a licensed professional engineer and he has been fined $500 from the state of Oregon for saying he was an engineer um, because he does not have a license as a professional engineer. Uh, and the course, this case will probably go to court and, and be adjudicated in a court of law. Uh, the state maintains if you are not a licensed professional engineer, you may have every degree in the world. You may teach engineering classes in local colleges, but you are not an engineer. Um, I think a trained engineer is an engineer, and he probably didn't even get a degree in civil engineering. Uh, um, It depends on how you think the English language should work. Should we be allowed to ban words in a country that claims to have freedom of speech? Uh, I think I gave you my opinion. <laughs> um, okay. The book also talks a little bit about, um, oh, well, as for a basis of ethics, um, and who you are ethical towards and how you treat people, that gets to be a real complex thing. People have different views. There's a whole field of philosophy called the ethics of philosophy. Um, theologians have colleges dedicated to um, ethics and and um, what what is ethics and what isn't ethics, and uh, you know who knows. Here at uh, Santa Clara University, there's the School of Applied, uh, School, uh, uh, Center for Applied Ethics, and which, among other things, they talk about, um, um, oh, the ethical phenomena, uh, ethics in open source software. That's probably a well worth reading, even though it's a little bit old. But still, you know, people like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and Pythagoras have a lot to say that is relevant to this day about ethics. And we also read, you know, later medieval, well, certainly we read um, Augustine, Aquinas, um, David Hume, Berkeley, uh, and the list goes on and on. Um, uh, Kant um, in, in terms of our ethical philosophies. So um, the question the books uh, ask is, you know, is ethics based on um, what is it? 
they've got a thing here. Well, you know, what role does Okay. Whoops. Went the wrong way there. What way does, you know, there are morals and, you know, I'm not And then there is our ethics that they say are standards or codes of behavior. Um, expected of an individual or a group by a group. Well, I, I don't know. There are ethical standards, and there are a lot of different ways to set those. And there are laws, and laws, in my mind, do not. They represent some approximation to ethics, but. Um, um, no more than that. There are certainly immoral laws in most societies. Uh, in some societies, most laws are immoral, I suppose. Um, religion plays a role in law, in, in ethics, um, but it's not the only factor. Um, okay. I'll leave that for you to figure out. I've been working on it 60 years, so you know. Um, they also talk about an IT and what is your moral responsibilities, what, who do you owe uh, um, some responsibility to in terms of employers, clients, um, your employees, um, other IT users, um, uh, society at large and that's something we all have to work out for ourselves and most of us, you know, we have different answers. Um, the book talks quite a bit about the Business Software Alliance. I should say a word or two about the Business Software Alliance. We have, um, at times, we have um, um, Oops. Um, the Business Software Alliance is an alliance of some of the biggest software companies in the U.S. and hardware companies. And they try to set up certain standards. Their standards really are to protect them. Uh, they're really not what I'd call ethical standards. Some of them do involve ethics. One of the things they try to do is to prevent um, piracy, software piracy. Um, software pro and, and they go to extremes in doing this. They always re they take the highest retail value of a piece of software, and if 10 million people steal a million dollar piece of hardware, they say, well, they lost 10 million times a million dollars. And so you should be tried as a criminal who stole 10 million times a million dollars. But of course, you didn't, you did do something wrong, but you didn't steal that sort of money because should it be a wholesale price, retail price, or should they look at the fact that at that price you just wouldn't have bought it? Certainly wouldn't have gotten 10 million copies. Um, yes, you did do harm to them, and yes, software theft is wrong, but some of the um, propaganda that we are given is also wrong. It's not quite as wrong as they say. Um, that's not to say that software piracy is acceptable, because I personally do not find it acceptable or that there are not penalties for it. I know of quite a few cases. I'm an open source guy, so I don't have to worry about a lot of this. But I do know of quite a few cases of, of software piracy that resulted in usually in large uh, financial settlements for the companies involved or the agencies involved. Um, in, 
I've heard of cases in West Africa, in Mali, in Niger, in countries with very, very little money where nonprofits doing charitable work used software that was uh, questionable, <laughs> stolen. And I think companies kind of allowed them to do this for quite a while so that they would really get into this and they'd use a lot of this. And then they came down with the force of law on these nonprofits, virtually bankrupting them and, and ending a lot of their good services to help people because they then had to pay lots of money to these software companies be for software which was pirated and they just didn't have the money in their budgets. That's why they pirated it in the first place because they couldn't afford it. Um, now their solution was more and more they were looking towards open source software which they should have been all the time but um, but um, or cheaper alternatives but you know it's a bad event. I was saw I saw a couple other events where disgruntled former employees seem I, I think I mean you never know because it's done anonymously but where I think disgruntled former employees turned in companies for software piracy in the two cases that come to my mind the disgruntled former employees had been in a position to install pirated software onto uh, computers prior to uh, their departure from the company. So, and I don't know if they were authorized to do this or if they did it on their own. Uh, in other words, I'm saying it was, um, it, this may have been used as a way of stabbing companies in the back. Uh, the companies may have been perfectly innocent. They still had to pay rather large settlements to the um, Software Business Alliance. Um, one of the, uh, yeah, and in the extreme, you can even go to prison for this. There's been several people in Oregon gone to prison. One person in particular that comes to my mind was Wayne and Cookie Shoe. Um, I they come to my mind. Wayne, um, Wayne and Cookie funded one of my high tech startups. So uh, doing open source software, it was quite legitimate, one hundred percent. But they were uh, they had a business on the side in Vancouver, Washington, where they were um, 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 remarketing software and hardware. Uh, mostly that came from the Far East. And they were doing it apparently in some rather creative ways. I have to admit, I, I did not work in that division of the company, but I had suspicions funny things were going on. I had no idea what was going on um, because I was leading a development team. But um, they were basically taking software that had come from legitimate sources, original like Microsoft type software on Microsoft type disk, but it had strange licenses, like maybe it was only licensed for use in the Far East, not for use in the Pacific Northwest, or there were some issues with license. Maybe it was only licensed for use from uh, on hardware manufactured by Dell computers or something like that. It was, there were limited licenses. They didn't come with full licenses. It was true Microsoft packages. And then they would acquire licenses <laughs> from somebody else <laughs> where they could get the licenses, but they couldn't get the, um, uh, but but they couldn't get the hard, the, the hard part of the software, the, the DVDs. And they would put the two together, <laughs> which is rather illegal. And um, Wayne was sentenced to three years in prison. I 
don't know how much time he actually had to serve, but most of the three years, I believe. And his wife, Cookie, this is um, what I'm showing you now is the archives from the FBI website. But they were on the front pages of the or Portland, Oregonian. Of, um, I think here they were on the Seattle Times. You know, they, they made the headlines. Um, and I think it says here, oh yeah, that Cookie, Shu's wife Cookie was sentenced to 30 days. Oh, based on fraudulent income tax filings. Plus they had to pay substantial fines and income taxes and, you know, I, I, I'm quite sure it left them very poor and impoverished. And, and of course, since 10 or 15 of their relatives, well, 10 maybe, since many of their relatives worked for their company, when the company went under, all these people were unemployed, the whole family, everybody. And Wayne and Cookie being immigrants, I suppose, put, you know, their kids, of course, had to, uh, had been in private schools. I'm sure they didn't have money to continue with those schools. Um, their um, their family was unemployed. The, the whole extended family, and since they were immigrants, I they I don't know if anything happened, but they could have been liable to be deported. And one or both of them were probably wanted in their home country. So, uh, you know potentially not a good thing. And I haven't checked, I don't know all the details on uh, um, uh, what's happened with them. Um, I do know that Cookie's sister and brother-in-law have been very successful. They opened a restaurant and they've done well since then. But, uh, but it's uh, not a good thing. Anyway, there's no, yeah, software piracy is wrong. So in spite of all this false propaganda about it, it, it's wrong. You shouldn't do it and you don't need to do it. We live in a world with terrific open source software, which I'll give a video on someday. And I, I just don't use proprietary software. It's too dangerous. There's too many risks involved. Well, I, I, I lie. I do use proprietary software. But most of what I do is with open source software, which is licensed uh, in such a way that it's hard to get into trouble. Now, the, your textbook did talk about one case where somebody got into a little bit of trouble using open source software. But um, that's very, very rare. And I think they were doing something quite bad. Um, Open source software is generally um, good in that it comes with source code or you can get source code for it. You, there's a couple different branches of open source software. One's big branch is bran uh, um, licensed under something called the artistic license where you don't even have to give out source code if you modify it. Um, software like that includes things like FreeBSD, NetBSD, OpenBSD, or, or operating systems like that, which, of course, FreeBSD is the kernel of um, Apple's operating systems. So, and they don't give out source code for it. They should, but they don't. Um, well, I mean, they, they don't, there's no legal reason they have to. It's the license doesn't require that. The other branch is called the uh, GPL or GNU or something like that. Uh, we usually call it the GPL. The GNU GPL. Uh, GPL stands for General Public License, and there's a version one, two, five. I, I you know, there's lots of details. Um, that does have the requirement that if you get the software. If with source code, you modify the source code, 
and you start to redistribute the binaries from the modified software, you must also redistribute the source code under the terms of the license that you got it under. So it means that is it once something's open source, it remains open source. It's mm, some people say a bit of a virus. It is a restriction, but it's an easy restriction to keep if you're fair and honest. It's you know, it, it, it's easy to keep. And actually, as I read the license, if you do not redistribute the software, uh, the modified version of the software, you don't really have to make the source code available. So if you're just um, what is so it doesn't inconvenience most users because most users aren't redistributing the software. Many of us do redistribute the software and it's not an inconvenience to make the source code available either, especially because we've got good systems for that. Okay, um, the other thing the book talks a little bit about is whistleblowing. Uh, you know, people like Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manning, um, maybe, well, there, there's always whistleblowers. Somebody, and you may be a whistleblower. I, I mean, if you find something going wrong with your company, in your company, or maybe somebody is doing something bad, wrong, you've got a number of choices. One, and it's not a bad choice, is ignore it. It's not my business. I didn't see it. Uh, of course, if you had to see it, or if your job was to see it, you can't quite say that. But one choice is ignore it, and it's not, it's often a very good choice. Another one is talk to the person in question and try to work out something with them and just get it done, uh, con privately and confidentially. Or you could turn it into your company, or worse comes to worse. You might have to take it to higher authorities, turn it into legal law enforcement, or which I have never had to do, thank heavens. I don't think. Or, 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 or turn it over to the press and publish it and put it on people's Facebook pages and, and you know, make a big deal out of it. Um, that's called a whistleblower. At times, you know, don't do that unless you have to do that. But if if you morally have to do that, do it. There's supposed to be something called whistleblower protection or um, laws that protect uh, some sort of laws that protect whistleblowers. There are none. <laughs> There may be laws every place. There is no protection for a whistleblower. So when you blow the whistle, and it's not, you know, I highly recommend it if you have to do it, but expect to be fired. Uh, and that's fair. Lots of good people are fired. They go on to do good things. But whistleblower protection laws do not work. They never have worked. They never will work. They, they don't work. Um, Witness Edward Snowden today. Witness Chelsea Manning. Witness uh, I can name hundreds of whistleblowers, and the end is never particularly good. Sometimes it's not that bad. I knew I did not know the man, but in the 1970s there was an accountant at the University of Montana who found illegal activities happening in the athletic department. They were, they had students getting um, work study who weren't working very hard, sometimes not at all. Well, actually, sometimes they had died in past years. Sometimes they weren't students. But the checks got signed every month, got cashed, and the money went into the athletic department. Um, which may not have been totally legal. Um, however, the judge, the jury, the lawyers, all were graduates of the University of Montana um, Law School, so legalities are flexible. And in the end, while there was a big trial, the federal government tried to convict a lot of people in the athletic department. 
nobody was convicted because they weren't sure who did the wrongdoing. And um, so nobody was convicted. And the accountant who brought this to people's attention in the first place and went through every channel on earth and took two years before he made this public, before he went to the federal government, he went to the pre the, the he went to people all the way up the rung in the university, he went to the athletic department, he went every place, he went to the president of the university, he finally went to the federal government. He was fired, he lost his job. Um, and then he was offered a job by paying as much or more at Anaconda Corporation who said they wanted an honest accountant. So, okay, he was fired, but it wasn't that bad. Um, I just want to warn you that, whistle, you know, whistle, take whistleblowing seriously. Don't believe in whistleblower protection laws. It talks a little bit about H-1V visas, B visas. Um, I'm a big supporter of H-1B visas. I've had a couple employees that we had to do visas on. I'm a big supporter of it when the program is used legitimately. Sometimes it is not used legitimately. It's hard to say what legitimate and not legitimate is, but we've seen gross abuses of it. Um, We've also seen a lot of places where it has assisted us in getting qualified people who then generate jobs for lots of other people. And um, it's a good program when it's properly used. Okay. misrepresentation, breach of contract. Um, okay. One thing is that people should be honest in their dealings, and that means not represent, misrepresenting what you can do, what you do do, or not going behind people's backs and doing things behind people's backs that they don't know about. I get so annoyed with our system of social media and this media and that media, they give the impression that they're giving something to people for free. But as the saying goes, um, what is it? If you don't know who's paying for it or if you're getting something for free, you are the product. And, you know, that is the case. And, and in most cases, open source software is different. But, but in these social media things, they are, there are horrible viruses. They're selling us down the river. They, they, they take our private information. They then use that for personal gain without really truly letting people know what they're doing. It's not up there up front, you know. We are selling, we are telling the world what your annual income is. Um, I think whether it's in your personal life or it's in your professional life or it's in your corporation's life, you, there is an ethics about what you do with information, how you handle it, who you give it to, how private you keep it, um, and, um, um, Enough said. Okay, there's a little discussion in here about something called the For Cor a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, uh, which says that it is a crime to bribe a foreign official or a foreign political party official or a candidate for a foreign political office. Um, this was passed many years ago. <laughs> I, Ironically, it is not a crime if you are a federal employee. <laughs> it's only a crime if you work for a private company. Um, I do not like corruption. I don't like bribery. But as a former Peace Corps volunteer and person who's lived overseas, uh, 
you just sometimes have to compromise some to, uh, you know, when in Rome, um, what is it, when in Rome, live as a Roman, and sometimes certain compromises are made. Now, don't be too enthusiastic about them, but, but, but sometimes you do have to compromise, and I think this law is a little arrogant in its outlook on life. I'm not saying I approve of bribes or or, or whatnot, but, but there are times when they seem like they're not that bad and they're the only alternative. Uh, I, I really despise systems that are totally, completely corrupt, and and uh, there there are countries. Well, I I was bothered when you know in Indonesia you would have to bribe a postal official and watch him postmark your stamp at one time to make sure that he didn't take the stamp off the envelope and sell it to the next customer. That is is too far. Uh, in Laos, in Laos during the Laotian War, um, it seemed like there was a bribe that had to be paid for everything. If you wanted to know where the toilet was, there'd be a bribe. Uh, um, it was a very poor country, and it was a very poor country. Um, and you know, having all these bribes did not help. But uh, but but you can understand them. Um, anyway, one does have to use one's discretion there. I um, I'm not a big fan of that law. It is law. It is the law of the land, a law of the world. It doesn't matter where in the world it happens. Maybe if you bribe somebody on the moon, you're in trouble. I don't know. Um, the next thing that the book does not talk about, but it is also a law, as I understand there is a law, that if you're a computer repair guy and you look at computers and you find some, and you should have found, and it's a vague law, I also don't approve of this law, the intent is, is legitimate, but it, you can be held responsible for child pornography that the computer has on it because I guess you're supposed to look at the computer to see if there's child pornography or something, but maybe not too much. I don't understand it. And, you know, certainly if there's something really bad, you know, you should turn, I think you should turn people in, but. Um, um, but but how much do you look? I, I don't think I should look at people's files any more than I have to. If I have to look at people's email in order to repair a, a um, corrupted, some corrupted data, then, you know, I can't help it. I got to look at it. But you, you can't look at email just because it's on the server and just because you have access to it. That is wrong in my, it's wrong. <laughs> I would say in my mind, but no, it's wrong. Um, and so this line, it's a little funny in that I don't understand how much poking around you're supposed to do. Certainly when somebody's computer is entrusted to me, I do as little poking around as, as possible to to uh, to fix or repair it. It's That's not my... Um, I, I'm not... I, I'm not law enforcement. I'm not a judge. Uh, I'm not a jury. I'm, you know... I'm just the poor guy that works with somebody's computer. Um, okay. Oh, let's see. Professional codes of ethics. Well, take it or leave it. I, I don't. Um, there's some value in them, and there's some disvalue in them. But there is some value. You know, I really think things like the conflict of interest practices that most 
that all good attorneys follow are really important and those are kind of a code of ethics that is enforced by the legal um, enterprise. Um, on the other hand, sometimes they go overboard too, um, or professional organizations do. Now, it does talk here about professional organizations. It lists several professional organizations. It lists the ACM, the IEEE, the, oh, I don't know. And, you know, I guess go out, buy memberships, and be a member. And anyway, I find I'm not big on organizations and professional membership necessarily. What I am big on is networking with people. And where you do that in my community is not in all of these big national organizations. Although I do like the ACM and I I read a lot of IEEE stuff and um, well and SANS too. So you know they're cool. But what I find really valuable is little local user groups. Usually they've got no name. They're you know and or here in Oregon we have hundreds of them and the place to find them is on a website called Caligator dot whoop dot org spelled just like it sounds Caligator dot org it's a um, calendar of local events by the open that was written by the open source community in Portland for the open source community in Portland. It's got all sorts of events on it. I highly recommend it and I recommend many of these organizations. Here's a free code camp hangout. Here's a Python flying circus. Uh, it's a Python group, programmers group, I take it. Here's the Puppet, Portland Puppet user group. Puppet is a systems administration tool, I think mostly for the Linux, Unix environment, but maybe it works on Windows, I don't know. Dork Bark, Dork Bot, those are people who do um, oh, a lot of hardware stuff, robotics type stuff. Uh, cool people. I've always meant to go to that myself, but I live in Corvallis. Portland's a long ways. Um, <coughs> okay. Um, Portland Ruby Brigade, that's Portland Ruby Programmers, PDX Women in Tech. <coughs> okay. Well, and you see there's many, many of these meetings every night. Most of them are free or some of them are held at restaurants, so you'll want to buy a dinner or, or buy some food with, with the meeting. Uh, some of them are held at universities. I am a member and kind of one of the chief founders of this one here, the Portland Linux Unix group, which has been meeting since 1994, yeah, generally at Portland State University. And um, they were good, uh, well, they were one of the earliest open source, they were the earliest open source group in Portland. And, um, and um, for a long time they were big. They're now not so big, but, um, but they have spawned many, many, many other groups. So um, I think we're still kind of important, even even if we're smaller now. Um, and they go on and on. And there's, you know, these are groups where you can go, you can learn things free of charge. Um, um, different ones are different. Our, our group, we you generally have a speaker on the first Thursday of the month talking on uh, usually we assume that people know quite a bit about computing, so but they don't know anything about specific areas. So we will have like talks like introduction to Ruby for non-Ruby programmers. <laughs> for people that program but don't know Ruby. Introduction to PHP for people who program but don't know PHP. Introduction to firewalls or well, Probably not firewalls because we all know about firewalls, but but specific fire rule wall protection rules or ways of building firewalls or uh, anyway things of that type. Um, sometimes they'll be about kernel hacking um, in the deep deep inner layers of the kernel that I had uh, understand nothing about what's going on there. Uh, other times it will be in you know. 
Oh, we've had talks on how to give a talk. Um, talks on, I think I've given talks on open source agriculture, um, on uh, farming. Um, you know, they, they go all over the board. These are good groups because they're generally informal. They're usually smaller meetings. They're informal. And if you go on a continual basis, you get to know people. And jobs actually get given out through these groups. It's not like they're in the business of getting you jobs or making jobs. or. But it's a matter of who knows whom and who trusts whom and who knows who can do what. And so I find them tremendously much more valuable than these big national groups that are, you're just, you know, you're number 592376 on a big list in a database someplace. Um, with these groups, you know, you're the guy sitting over there in the corner with a beer in his hand. Um, I find these much more satisfying and much more um, uh, rewarding in every way. Okay, so I am a big fan of local user groups. I, I know it takes time. It's okay, certifications and things of that type uh, and government licensing. Well, I'm not big. I, I'm personally not big on certifications. I'm not big on government licensing. Um, uh, except in areas where, you know, there's something really pressing for it, um, such as possibly medicine. But in most areas, I think it's a way of keeping other, it's a way of keeping competition down. Uh, I mean, um, it's purely a way of keeping competition down. And, um, For one thing, you know, in the com uh, and I'm going to go back to what I said in some of my earlier business uh, uh, videos. In the computer business, as in many businesses, being the best, sharpest, incredible Python programmer, knowing every line of Python, knowing what widget does this, what widget does that, being able to do really great on a Python test, being is not, doesn't make you the best programmer. <laughs> um, because so much of it's about understanding the problem, understanding who's going to use the programs, understanding what will make them happy. That's more psychology. Understanding the needs of those people, what really down deep they need in order to do their job. A lot of it is about listening to people, about, um, and if your code is a little bit sloppy, well, you know, um, if it runs and it runs without error, that's okay, even if it's really ugly. Uh, it's better if it's kind of nice because it's going to be hard to maintain if it's really ugly. Um, but um, but most of these certifications are too limited in their view of what computing is, or too limited in their view of what you know. Like, why does a barber need a license? Uh, uh, it's they're, they're, they they view things in too limited a fashion. If you want to be effective in this world, really don't be too specialized. Be a compromise where you've got, you're the intersection of multiple specializations so that you're the guy that can put together multi, uh, you know, multiple people or a team that has foresters and programmers and artist and and maybe a mathematician or two the person that can get all those people to work together and 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 has enough knowledge of each of those areas that they can talk with all those people and and make the whole thing make sense those are valuable people and and you know i think we 
tend to push people into these narrow specialties where, you know, it, it's a lot of fun for the powers that be because they can test people and they can rank people and they can put up statistics and put them in lines of who's best and who's not best. And But that's just not what we need in the in the world. We, we need people that can, you know, in the end, we're kind of all the same. So anyway, um, that is, um, that's most of the stuff that I had to say about ethics. Oh, there's a little bit of stuff about compliance with HIPAA laws and stuff. Um, working in medical technology has gotten really complicated because they put in huge gobs of privacy laws that are really um, uh, meant to protect people's privacy um, and um, maybe they do because I can't get my own information when I want it. <laughs> but um, it's made programming and made program design and made medical information technology very complicated because you have to know a lot of legal stuff in order to be able to do it. Um, and that's becoming more true in certain financial services, in, in many areas, areas that I prefer not to work in. Um, but uh, um, OK. Well, that tells, that says a little bit about my feelings about computer security. You know, I, I really do, or that says nothing about my feelings about computer security. This tells, says a little bit about my feelings about uh, computer um, ethics, a, a field that I think is very important and is sometimes neglected because I think it's a really hard field because um, because it just is. I mean, partly there's no simple answers. And different people think differently and different situations are different. And uh, um, and and it's really um, hard to know what to do sometimes. Huh? And uh, but that's what makes the world fun. And um, thank you. Bye bye.